Um, so I'm going to talk about a new topic in number theory. So I would like to kind of end these series of lectures by talking about something that like brings together a bunch of things we discussed before, but I have no idea what, if any, topic uh, might do that. So uh, instead, I'm just going to talk about one more thing that seems interesting and is maybe the kind of the most interesting from a purely uh, number theoretic uh, perspective. So I'm going to speak about my joint work with uh, uh, with with Mark Schusterman. Schusterman on a series of uh, old conjectures in, in number theory on the, the twin primes conjecture chalice conjecture uh, quadratic Bateman horn begin by talking about chalice conjecture. Um, which is a conjecture about the Mobius function. Which is defined for, uh, well let's say, let's say for integers as minus 1 to the r if n is, well, maybe plus or minus, a product of r distinct primes for p1, pr prime and distinct. Uh, and it's 0 otherwise. Uh, so if, 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 if n cannot be written in that form, which we know from the unique factorization theorem, is equivalent to n having some prime square divisor, so n, n being not square free. So it's roughly minus 1 raised to the number of prime factors, um, except that for, for many purposes, it's convenient to kind of zero out all the numbers that have a repeated prime factor rather than just counting at as like multiple, multiple prime factors. Um, and so uh, the conjecture is if you have d1 through dk integers that are distinct, um, if you sum over natural numbers less than x, Mobius of n plus d1, product up to Mobius of n plus dk, divide by x. This should converge as x goes to infinity to 0. Um, so, this statement is a reflection of the philosophy that the Mobius function should behave like a random function. Or at least its sign should behave like a random sign, like a coin flip independently for each number. Because when Mobius is zero versus non-zero, it's not random. It's like it's, it's a periodic or a series of periodic phenomena with period 4 and 9 and 25 and so on. Uh, but the sign part is, is totally random. Uh, and so if we determine the sign of each of these values independently, their, their, their product would also behave like a coin flip. Um, and, and so it, the law of large numbers would indeed say that this, this limit would, would, would be true. 
Um, and uh, so this, um, this conjecture is not known. This is unknown uh, for k greater than 1. The k equals 1 version is basically equivalent to the prime number theorem, um, uh, except uh, there is a version of it that's known uh, with additional uh, averaging in x. So if you average the left side over x equals to 1, 2, 4 up to a power of 2, um, and then take the limit as the power of 2 grows and grows, then you would get conversions uh, to 0. This is for k equals 2 uh, by work of tau and for k odd by work of tau and teravinen. Uh, which is all building on, on the breakthrough of Matomaki and Rajivy. Um, um, and so this is a conjecture that's focusing on the randomness of the Mobius function in a kind of additive way. Where, so the Mobius function is, is, a, is a multiplicative function. It behaves nice when numbers multiply. And so we're instead plugging in sums of numbers and, and seeing what we get. Or another way of describing it is it's, it's, it's a conjecture of the local randomness of the Mobius function. So in this conjecture, and it's going to be typically much larger than d1 through dk, so we're looking at very nearby numbers and saying that the Mobius should behave like independently uh, 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 among those. Um, and if you knew this conjecture, you, you would get this some kind of local limit of the Mobius function uh, behaves randomly, or, okay, well, or maybe a slight variant of the conjecture. Um, but uh, Chawla actually made a more general conjecture than this, uh, which is not kind of purely additive, but is, 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 a, is a hybrid of addition multiplication, so, 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 so a polynomial. So the, the, the polynomial Chawla conjecture Uh, would be that f is an integer polynomial that is non-constant. Um, then the limit as x goes to infinity, the sum of natural numbers less than x, Mobius of f of n, or 1 over x, should be zero. Um, so again, if, if Mobius were were random, then this sum would certainly cancel in X by the law of large numbers. Um, and, and, and so the, the conjecture is that Mobius is behaving sufficiently like a, a random function. Um, and there's something a little bit tricky here, because if this polynomial F has a repeated prime factor, as, as, as a polynomial of integers, then this sum is behaving non-randomly, but it's behaving non-randomly because all the terms are almost all the terms are zero because they will all have a, a, a square factor, uh, and so the sum will cancel also in the non-random non case. And so this this polynomial version is much harder 
even with additional averaging because you can't take advantage of the local and additive structure of the, the sum and like play it off against the Mobius structure, the multiplicative structure of Mobius. It, it, it is, it's, it's harder to kind of get track of any, any kind of structure. Um, and, and so it's, it's not known, okay, this is known, this is known for k is equal to 1. Um, and it's, it's, it's essentially a version of Dirichlet's theorem on primes and arithmetic progressions. Because the polynomial of degree 1 is just summing over an arithmetic progression. And because you can relate these Mobius sums, so sums over primes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, not constant. Yes, degree k. Um, so let's consider um, an analog for FQ of T. Uh, and so here, for, for the first time, it's going to be really important that FQ is a general finite field and may not just be the prime field, uh, Z mod P. Um, and so we, we first need to define the, the Mobius function, and we'll define it in, in, in the same way. Mobius of f will equal minus 1 to the r if f is equal to alpha times pi 1 to pi r for alpha unit in fq, pi 1 through pi r distinct primes. This thing's monic irreducible polynomials and zero otherwise. Um, and uh, here we had a polynomial in Z of X, so the coefficients should now be polynomials in FQT, which means we essentially have a polynomial in in two variables, fq joint t of x. Uh, so the conjecture is f in fq of t comma x, uh, not, so instead of non-constant, we have a, a slightly stronger condition. We would not like our polynomial to be a polynomial only in x to the p. It should have some exponent that's not a multiple of p. Um, and I'll write degree f is k. So the limit is n go to infinity, the sum over monic polynomials, degree f is n, of the Mobius of uh, f of t comma f. Okay, I need my big polynomial G so that I don't have to keep saying F. G of T F, 1 over Q to the N. The limit should equal 0. And so this is just a perfect analog of the conjecture uh, we had over the integers. We're summing over polynomials of a given degree instead of integers of a given size. We still think the Mobius function sum should converge to zero. Um, the only difference is we have this slightly stronger condition on the polynomial. Uh, and that's for a very good reason. The conjecture is actually known by work of Connor, Connor, and Gross to sometimes be false when uh, this condition is, 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 is not satisfied. I know this also came up in your second lecture, but could you remind me again why you replace like less than x with like degree, like an equal in the... Um, okay, so it doesn't super matter. So you could, uh, I could have stated this one with like a, a dyadic interval from x to 2x and it would have been an equivalent statement. And I could have stated this one with a less than or equal to and it would be an equivalent statement. 
um, it seems slightly cleaner to write, I mean, it basically it kind of requires the, the least number of symbols to write less than x uh, in, in, in this case rather than to put lower and upper bounds. But here it seems simpler to do inequality. If I was doing it less than or equal to n, then the number of polynomials to divide by would be q to the n plus q to the n minus 1 plus et cetera down to 1, which would be a, a slightly more complicated thing to divide by. Um, yeah, but it, 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 it's, it's just kind of. The general principle is to save chalk. Yeah. In both cases. Exactly, yeah. Can you give the simplest example of polynomial in x to the power p for each of the six holes? Um, Okay, so so let, let, let me, I would tell you the mechanism not by giving an example. So and so this, this will come. The theorem is this function for any polynomial if in x to the p. This function is um, is periodic in G. It only depends on the congruence class of G modulo something, uh, and then. Yeah, so then it's clear that even if your periodic polynomial doesn't cancel, if you just compose it with like a linear polynomial, you can then make it, so it cancel. Yeah, any polynomial is, is periodic. Most of these periodic polynomials will cancel, but then you can compose it with something else to make it not cancel. I, th I, th I think it's true that most of them cancel. I don't remember. Um, uh, yeah, so this is the mechanism is there's this exceptional periodicity. Um, so the theorem of myself and Mark is uh, if the size of the finite field Q is a power of P, the conjecture is true as long as Q is greater than 4, K squared, P squared, E squared. Okay, so this is a somewhat strange statement. Okay, first, you, you didn't miss a variable e. e is 2.718, et cetera. Uh, so p is, is the characteristic. So both the size of the finite field and the characteristic are showing. And then kind of unsurprisingly, the problem gets harder as the degree grows. So uh, the degree of, of the um, degree of the polynomial enters into our formula. And so how does a criterion work? It never holds over the finite field fp, because p is always less than p squared. It never holds over the finite field fp squared. But for all other prime powers, this is going to hold with finitely many exceptions for a given k. So there are a lot of fields where our theorem uh, applies, even if there's infinitely many where it doesn't. Why do you say q is a power of p? q is a power of p. Oh. Well, I need, to, I need to explain that p is a variable, is the prime that q is a power of. So q, fq, is the, q is the size of the finite field, and it's a power of some prime. And I'm saying let p be the prime which q is a power of. Um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, so if I was, if I was, Giving a series of lectures only on this theorem, I would start at the very beginning by saying let fq, let q be a power of p, and let fq be the field with q elements. But because I've been talking about finite fields fq the entire time, I'm saying like now let's introduce p, which is the characteristic which has been hidden before. Oh, actually, you did use it before. Never mind. Oh, right. mo mo mostly hidden. Oh, yes, right. Is it, that's a very good point. I did just use it really, really right up there. That's a very good point. Okay, so I, 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 sh I should have said that p is the characteristic up there. Yes. Um, uh, and then, uh, okay, the only other comment I have on this is the 4 is probably removable by being slightly more careful, but I mean, it's just a constant, so nobody really cares. Um, and uh, 
Okay, so I want, I want to say something about how this is um, proven, um, and then I will describe the applications of this statement, or really of a, of a more precise uniform form of it, uh, to primes, uh, prime counting problems uh, in, in FQT. Um, and so, unlike in all the previous problems I'm, I'm talking about, I'm not going to just take this sum and convert it into geometry in the most straightforward possible way of like interpreting the set we're summing over as a space and the, and the function is a sheaf on some space and just directly calculating the cohomology of that sheaf. Um, and, you know, proving cohomology vanishing and bounding with Betty numbers. So what I'm, what I'm instead going to do is to use a, a trick that converts the sum into a sum of simpler sums and apply geometric methods to each of those simpler sums. Uh, and you can also think of this geometrically of I have a problem on the cohomology of some space and I'm slicing that space up into smaller spaces whose cohomology I can, I, I can calculate uh, directly and I'm getting like information of the cohomology of the bigger space sort of only, only indirectly. So the, but first we have to figure out what the kind of geometric meaning of the Mobius function is. Um, so the, uh, the key identity for, for doing that is that the Mobius function um, of, of a polynomial, which we actually, I think I'll for simplicity assume that f is, f is, f is a monic. The Mobius function of f, say it's degree n, is minus 1 to the n times a character of the discriminant of f. So here delta is polynomial discriminant. Uh, and chi is a quadratic character. It's a uh, so it's a it's a non-trivial homomorphism from the multiplicative group of FQ to plus or minus one, and we set chi of zero to be zero. So it's essentially like a, a Legendre symbol. Um, and um, so this, is, this gives us a geometric interpretation because the discriminant is going to be a polynomial function in the coefficients of f. And then this quadratic character we can uh, construct from a sheave associated with the double covering of the square root of the discriminant. Um, so why is this true? Um, well, first, both sides are 0. If and only if f has a repeated, repeated prime factor, uh, which happens if and only if f has a repeated root. Um, otherwise, minus one the Wise, the polynomial f is going to have n distinct roots in f q bar. Um, and the prime factors correspond to orbits. So the number of prime factors is the number of orbits. Um, and so minus 1 to the number of prime factors 
is minus 1 to the number of orbits, uh, which is minus 1 to the n. Um, sorry, the orbits, the, the orbits of Frobenius. So Frobenius is acting on the roots, and I'm considering the orbits of the Frobenius action. Uh, and because Galois orbits always correspond to irreducible factors, and Frobenius generates the Galois group, number of prime factors is the number of orbits. And the number of orbits of a permutation, if we raise that to the power of minus 1, that's always minus 1 to the n times the sine of the permutation. Um, and then for any element of the Galois group, for any polynomial, the sine can be calculated from the action on the square root of the discriminant of the polynomial. So sine of Frobenius is equal to Frobenius of the square root of the discriminant divided by the square root of the discriminant, which is equal to the discriminant times q minus 1 over 2, which is chi of the discriminant. Oh, yes. Oh, that's a very good point. Uh, yes, so this is only works for p odd. Uh, yes, all, in fact, every result I state today will be for p odd, probably. Um, so, Uh, so what you, you, you certainly could use um, this uh, formula to um, study, to, 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 to geometrically study the sum uh, uh, directly. So, um, I guess another way of saying chi of delta f is the number of elements in fq such that y squared is equal to delta of f minus 1. Um, because if it's a perfect square other than 0, it has two square roots, which is 1 plus 1. If it's not a square, it has 0 square roots, which is 1 minus 1. And if it's 0, it has 1 square root, which is 1 plus 0. Um, so the sum f in fq t plus Mobius of f of f. Um, if you if you assume that the degree of f of f is is, is constant, which is kind of e easy to rig up, this would be minus one to the n um, times. Uh, the sum, or the, the size of the set of f in fqt plus degree f is n, and y in fq, uh, with y squared is equal to delta of f, of, or I think it should be a g, delta of g of f. Minus q to the n. So you, you count pairs of a polynomial and a square root of the discriminant of that polynomial plugged into something. Um, and then you, you subtract off an expected main term of q to the n, and that's what you're bounding. So we would need to calculate the cohomology of this, this variety parameterizing of some variety with an equation y squared is equal to delta of g of f. So, 
the problem is that this variety is we don't really know how to calculate the cohomology of it. It's, it's, it's some messy thing. It can have s complicated singularities that seem to depend on uh, the polynomial G in, in, in a complicated way. Um, so that isn't what we do. Um, what we instead do is use the the periodicity observation that is made, made by, by Conrad, Conrad, and Gross, we use kind of, kind of our, our own variant of it. So, so we want to use the fact that if we plug in Mobius of G of R plus S to the P. Um, as a function of S, uh, depends only on S modulo something in some polynomial depending on, on R. Let me say some function m depending on r and g. Um, so let, let me explain where this periodicity is, is coming from. Um, and I'll first do it in the simplest case. If we just look at the linear, the identity polynomial, so mu of r plus s to the p itself. Well, it's minus 1 to some degree times this character evaluated at this discriminant of r plus s to the p. So what is the discriminant? of a polynomial, it's the product of all the differences between the roots squared. And um, what that means is that up to some sign, well, I think for general polynomial, delta of f is the resultant of f with the derivative of f. So the, okay, or let me say it like this, alternate derivative of f with f. So if I take the value, the resultant of two polynomials is the product of the values of one polynomial and the roots of the other polynomial. And if you take the value of the derivative of f at one of the roots of f, you get the product of the differences of that root with all the other roots. And so we multiply from all the roots we get all the differences between roots um, with each one appearing twice, just like the discriminant, um, up to some sign depending only on the degree. Um, and then this is, again, up to some sign. It's the same thing as the resultant of f with f prime, the products of the values of f at the roots of the derivative of f. Um, so that means the Mobius function of r plus s to the p is plus or minus some boring sign chi evaluated at the resultant of r plus s to the p at the derivative of r plus s to the p. So we have the derivative of r, and then the derivative of s to the p is p times the derivative of s times s to the p minus 1, which is 0, because p is 0. Um, so this uh, is a depends only on s modulo r prime, and it depends on s modulo r prime in a very nice way. Um, it's it, this is. Um, 
Um, I mean, um, in particular, you can take, uh, if, at least for r, you can take, um, for r square free at least, you can take a pth root of r modulo r prime, and you get the resultant of like r to the 1 over p plus s, whole thing to the p with r prime. And that's just equal to the resultant of r to the 1 over p plus s with r prime raised to the power p. Uh, and you plug it into chi, because p is odd. You don't really care if you raise to the power p or not. Um, so you get the, the, the um, a, sh a shift of the resultant with r prime. Uh, and that's basically a shift of a, of a Dirichlet character modulo r prime. Uh, so in, in kind of the simplest case, in the simplest case, we end up with Dirichlet character size. Um, uh, and so there are there are tools uh, in analytic number theory to bound in a non-trivial way sums of these kinds of Dirichlet characters. In particular, we're summing these Dirichlet characters over all polynomials of a given degree which behaves like an interval in the integers. So you can apply techniques from number theory for solving Dirichlet characters in solving Dirichlet characters in an interval. Unfortunately, these techniques are not very helpful unless p is very, very small. If p is like 3 or something, you can do something. Uh, because, but otherwise, the um, Uh, interval that you need to sum over um, is 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 too short. Okay, sorry. I should, I should explain. Um, I should explain what we're doing here. So we're, what we're doing is we're observing that the sum for f of in f q join t degree f is equal to n. Um, mu of g of f can be written as the sum of r in fq t plus degree f is r, uh, the sum of s in fq t degree of f less than n over p, um, mu of g of r plus s to the p uh, times 1 over q to the floor function of n over p. Um, because if we choose s, we're choosing s of degree less than n over p, so that the degree of s to the p is less than n. Uh, and so adding s to the p to r won't, won't, won't affect its degree. And then every f can be expressed as r plus s to the p for like every value of s, for, for unique value of r for every s. And so if you divide by the number of, of values of s, then you, you get the same sum. Um, and so to get cancellation in this original sum, we just need to get cancellation in the sum over s. Um, but even in the sum over s, it's hard to get cancellation here by traditional analytic means because the degree of f is like n over p, or degree of, sorry, degree of r is equal to n, degree of s is less than n over p. Degree of s is, le is like less than n over p. Uh, the modulus of this character r prime has degree n. Um, so this is something like summing a uh, Uh, summing a Legendre symbol a plus s over b for all s of size less than b to the 1 over p. 
Um, and so this sum, we can't, we can't show any cancellation in this sum in a number theory context unless p is at most 4, where we can use the Burgess bound. So for only very small p, as, as p is, is getting larger, this sum we're trying to show cancellation in is getting shorter, and only for very small p do we have a hope of showing cancellation by, um, by geometric methods. By, sorry, by arithmetic methods. Um, uh, but for geometric methods, things are much better. This sum uh, looks so. Uh, let me let me describe. Um, the geometry So, um, so as a polynomial uh, in the coefficients of S, this resultant R is the one over P plus s with r prime is a, pro, is, a, is a very nice polynomial. It's a product of linear factors. Uh, which are basically up to shift. The values of s are the roots of r prime. Just by the definition of the resultant, it's the product of the values of one polynomial at the roots of another. So if we, if we, for this polynomial, do the same trick of taking uh, y squared equal to the polynomial, um, so bounding the sum s in fqt degree f degree s less than uh, chi of the resultant of r to the 1 over p plus s with r prime uh, is roughly the same as counting FQ points on the variety y squared is equal to this resultant of r to the 1 over e plus s with r prime, which is a product of linear factors. So another way to say this we have a branched cover of affine space, an affine space of dimension 4 of n over p, uh, which is branched at an arrangement of hyperplanes in, aff in affine space. And we're trying to calculate the cohomology of this double cover. Um, and uh, uh, an, an equivalent way of saying this is, is we're trying to calculate the cohomology of the complement of this hyperplane arrangement twisted by a one-dimensional locally constant sheet, the, like the locally constant 
sheaf of rank one that corresponds to this double cover. Um, and uh, an arrangement of hyperplanes <laughs> is not nearly as, as scary a geometry as the vanishing locus of this discriminant of a general polynomial. And it, like, in fact, the same kind of trick uh, works in, in general. So in general, the, uh, the discriminant of g of r plus s to the p as a polynomial in the coefficients of, of s is a product of linear factors. Uh, which are obtained uh, by evaluating S uh, at some points, finally many points. Um, so how can we check this is true in general, well, we, we can use the fact in algebraic geometry that, that, that a polynomial is, is basically determined uh, by its vanishing set. Or, or more precisely, a polynomial is a product of, an ir of, of powers of irreducible factors. And you can't tell the powers just from looking at the vanishing set, but you can tell what the irreducible factors are. So it's so it suffices uh, to prove its vanishing set is um, a union of hyperplanes which are all of the form the set of all s that take a particular value at a particular point. Um, because any polynomial that vanishes of the union of hyperplanes will be um, uh, a, a, a product of linear terms. Oh. And well, how does this work? So delta of g of r plus s to the p is equal to 0 if and only if g of r plus s to the p has a repeated root at some point, we'll call it a. Um, and so this happens if and only if uh, g of r plus s to the p and the derivative with respect to t of g of r plus s to the p uh, both vanish at, um, at a. Uh, but this derivative by the chain rule is uh, dg dt evaluated r plus s to the p um, Uh, plus r prime times uh, dg dx evaluated r plus s to the p. Um, and um, so if we evaluate this um, so, so crucially, this derivative it doesn't depend at all on the derivative of s. Um, yeah, let me give you a little bit more space. Um, 
So then we, if we plug in a, what we get is this, this occurs if and only if g of a r plus s to the p evaluated a equals 0 and dg dt of a r plus s to the p of a plus r prime of a uh, dg dx of a r plus s to the p of a is equal to 0. So this is two equations uh, in the two variables. A and uh, r plus s to the p of a, or you can think of it as an equation in a and, a and s of an a. Uh, and so generically, these two equations will have finally many solutions because these two curves uh, don't intersect. Um, Uh, and um, um, and you know, in in the case where where it does have some some uh, some uh, there's some curve where they where they intersect, um, you you can check that's like a de degenerate case, and it it. it um, Uh, you, you, you still end up getting something, something periodic uh, there. Um, and so, so there's, there's finally many pairs of, of values of A of S of A where this, this can vanish, and which is exactly what um, we, we claimed in terms of this union of hyperplanes. Um, um, so I want to talk next about the geometry of hyperplane arrangements. What makes what makes them uh, okay? So. Which, which ones are nice and which ones are bad? So normally, if we have a variety or, or a branch cover variety, we would study its singularities and we would, you know, we would like it to be smooth or at least to have as few singularities as possible and that will make it easier to calculate the cohomology. Um, an arrangement of hyperplanes, in some sense, it has a singularity whenever two or more of the hyperplanes intersect. That's where you'll see singularities of this double cover branched at the arrangement of hyperplanes. Um, so in that sense, our, our variety has very bad singularities. But um, for hyperplane arrangements, that's not the most, the best notion. What makes a hyperplane arrangement nice is if the hyperplanes intersect uh, generically or, or, or transversely. Um, so, the, so the singularities of a hyperplane arrangement are the points of, of non-transverse intersection. Um, uh, what that means is there are m hyperplanes uh, intersecting 
in a space of co-dimension less than m. So if two hyperplanes interact, uh, intersect at a space of co-dimension two, three dimensions intersect at a space of co-dimension three, and so on, that is generic. That is what would happen for a random collection of hyperplanes. So whenever this doesn't happen, uh, and, and there's, there's excess dimension of the intersection, um, that is a non-generic behavior that makes potentially the behavior of the, the cohomology more subtle. Um, and then for our hyperplane arrangement, this happens only for finitely many points. Um, so, so why is this true? This is again true for some elementary reasons involving the, um, the, the, the geometry of polynomials. So our hyperplanes all have the form s of a is equal to b. So if you have m of them, you get s of a1 is equal to b1, s of a m equals to bm uh, for a1 comma b1 up to a m comma bm uh, distinct. distinct pairs. Uh, so we're looking at the intersection of hyperplanes as a set of solutions to this kind of system of equation. If a i is ever equal to a j for i not equal to j, then b i will have to be unequal to b j because our, our, our equations are distinct. We don't want a redundant set of equations. Uh, and there's no solutions at all. Um, otherwise, we, we have the problem of polynomial interpolation. We've fixed the value of our polynomial at m distinct points, and we want to know how many polynomials satisfy it. Uh, the, and the general feature of polynomial interpretation, the interpolation, the coefficient, the, the, the equations are linearly independent. We can choose a polynomial of degree. Uh, less than m going through any, any of these m points. Um, so the solutions have co-dimension m. Uh, unless m is greater than our, the dimension of our space of polynomials, which is for a function of n over p. Uh, in which case the solutions are zero dimensional. So if you have a space of polynomials, you're fixing their value at a bunch of points. The only way that the dimension can be larger than you expect is if the dimension is zero, if the dimension is very small, but your expectation were it was even smaller, so you expected it to be negative. Um, and, 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 and so the only points that can be singularities are the solutions, these zero-dimensional solution sets, of which there's finally many, because there's finally many uh, linear equations on this list, there's finally many subsets. Um, so we have a 
hyperplane arrangement, and with this like natural notion of singularities for hyperplane arrangements, it has very mild singularities. It, 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 it has it's simple normal crossings or away from finitely many points. Um, Um, and this is even true at infinity. If you extend the hyperplanes projectively to infinity, then uh, there will have no points at infinity where they fail to be simple normal crossings. Or, no, it's not quite true. It's because the, the parallel ones intersect each other at infinity. Uh, but other than that, they, they, they will um, they'll be simple normal crossings. Um, Um, and so we use we apply kind of general methods to estimate the cohomology. of the complement of a hyperplane arrangement with coefficients uh, well, in, in, in a rank one locally constant chief. Um, so the locally constant sheaf is coming here from basically splitting the cohomology of this covering into, into two pieces, one which is invariant under the operation sending y to minus y, and the other one which is, has sign flipped by the operation, and then the sign flip piece part is, is the cohomology of a rank one sheaf on the complement of this hyperplane arrangement with and so such sheaves are kind of easy to parameterize around each hyperplane. The monodromy is given by, well, in the complex setting, by some complex number. In the l attic setting, some, some, some root of unity. And, and those numbers are, are totally independent. So, so for any tuple of like a number associated to each hyperplane, we get a sheaf. Um, and then we can prove cohomology vanishing results under this kind of genericity hypothesis on the hyperplanes uh, and also some kind of mild genericity hypothesis on the um, on, on the on the monodromy of this local system because a vanishing would certainly not be true if your rank one locally constant sheet is just a constant sheet for example um, in, in, so we, we wrote two papers about this. In the first paper, we used a result that was very specialized to a specific form of hyperplane arrangements. Um, and the second one, we used a slightly more general method, which we borrowed from or, or adapted from work of Cohen, Dimka, and Orlik. Uh, and they did work over the complex numbers, and we adapted their method to, to characteristic p. And uh, generalized it in some ways and specialized it in other ways. Um, and so proving this cohomology vanishing result gives you um, a bound for uh, we, the count of points on this variety gives you a bound for this sum, and then summing that bound over R gives us the bound we want for the Mobius function. Um, okay, maybe we should take a 
break and then I'll talk about primes. Does that sound good? So, uh, I mean, a, a very general statement is if you have x on affine variety, um, x bar of projective compactification. Then we have a j from x to x bar, open immersion. Uh, and if you have k, a perverse sheaf on x. Then the cohomology with compact supports uh, uh, with coefficients in k maps to the usual cohomology with coefficients in k. Uh, and it lives in a long exact sequence relating to the cohomology of, of the boundary of the compactification with coefficients in the push forward of k. Um, and so this vanishes in degrees strictly less than zero, this vanishes in degrees greater than zero. So the simplest case is if the cohomology of the boundary vanishes, this boundary contribution in infinity vanishes, these two are equal, and so they vanish in every degree except for zero. So that's a very powerful vanishing statement. It's what I was using uh, in the work with Templier. Um, here, uh, but there's also a weaker statement, which is if, um, if J star K is supported uh, on a sub-variety of dimension, a set of dimension less than or equal to D, um, then by, by a semi-perversity argument, this will vanish this will vanish for um, i less or equal to, or for, for i greater than d, I think. Uh, and that forces this by the long exact sequence to vanish for i greater than d plus 1. So as long as this push forward is supported on a very low dimensional set, then um, you. Uh, have also a pretty good bound on the cohomology. Um, and so for the hyperplane arrangement, this seems like a reasonable um, strategy. You have an affine sheaf on an affine space. There's a very natural compactification, which is projective space. You, you can push forward to that, and you can hope um, to show vanishing kind of using the monodromy around the, the hyperplane at infinity inside this projective space. Unfortunately, you have a problem. There's sometimes no monodromy around the hyperplane at infinity in projective space. In our problem, that happens roughly half the time, so it's quite a frequent event. Um, and so what you do, the, the, the trick, is you do a switch. You, you pick one of your other hyperplanes and you, 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 you let the affine variety be the complement of that hyperplane in projective space. Because every hyperplane in projective space, its complement looks like affine space. Um, so you apply to, to x the complement of a well-chosen hyperplane. Uh, in this projective space for a function of n over p. Um, and you, you, you do some kind of local calculation using your knowledge of the singularities when you have transversality that makes it easy to calculate. When you don't have transversality, it's only finitely many points and it's just a zero dimensional set. Um, so 
you need, the, the most important thing is that you need the monodromy around your hyperplane to be non-trivial. So, so the, the, um, if, we're, if we're writing y squared is equal to the product of linear factors, we need to pick one of the linear factors with odd exponent. And the other thing you need to check is we have, we don't want to have any other parallel hyperplanes. So if s of a is equal to, we want to have an a that only appears once on our list of equations. So we want to have uh, no, no other hyperplane on our list of equations which is powerful, which is parallel to it. And then we can use, so you need to check that such a hyperplane exists for most, um, most values of, of R. Um, and, and you can check this under some generosity condition on G, and then you can force this generosity condition on G. It doesn't always hold, but it holds after some substitution. So there's some like, there, there, there's some, you know, there's some some details in in rigging things to make sure this condition happens. But the, yeah, the, the main the main thing is yeah, the hyperplane should be kind of isolated, should not have parallel ones, and it should have this non-trivial monodromy. Um, and since writing this. We came up with a different method, which should handle well. Okay, should ha handle handle some of the non-isolated cases. But you definitely want to find. You definitely need a hyperplane with non-trivial monodromy because if there's no hyperplanes with non-trivial monodromy, there's no cohomology vanishing because you just have just the comp cohomology of this hyperplane arrangement. And it'll have some compactly supported cohomology in degree twice its dimension, which is just an enormous degree. Um, so you, you, so the, the proof must somewhere take advantage of the monodromy being non-trivial, and we're taking advantage of it really only at one hyperplane, which is kind of a, con a convenient thing to do. Um. So, um, uh, uh, very classic conjecture in number theory is the twin primes conjecture, which says there are infinitely many, infinitely many n with n and n plus 2 both primes. Oh, sorry, n plus 2. two. And there's a generalization of it due to Bunyakovsky, which might have, in fact, been the original statement, which says that for d even, there exist infinitely many n with d or n, n plus d plus both prime. And a more refined version of this was proven, or sorry, was conjectured by Hardy and Littlewood. And so, as always in number theory, we don't really want to prove something as infinite. It's much better to, to know how many there are in a given um, interval. So you can take for d not zero, um, the set of n less than x with n and n plus d both prime. Okay, well, if you take the size of the set and then you divide by x over log x squared, this should converge as x goes to infinity to some constant 
CD, a constant depending on D. Um, and this conjecture is motivated or can be motivated by the philosophy of randomness of primes. If we, if we think of each number n as being prime with probability 1 over log n, then the probability n and n plus d are both prime is going to be approximately 1 over log n squared. And summing over n less than x, that's approximately x over log x squared. And, and the constant cd comes from the fact we have to adjust for example, for the fact that almost all primes are even, almost all primes are not multiple of three, we adjust for congruence conditions, modulo small primes. And so CD is, is a product over prime factor, over prime numbers, and it depends on which primes uh, divide D. Okay. Yes, there is a neat formula for it, yes. Um, and this is something that we can prove, we, we, we can conjecture an analog of in FQT. Um, so for D not zero in FQT, take the limit of n goes to infinity cardinality of the set of f monic degree f is equal to n f f plus d are, are, are um, irreducible if we divide this by the q to the n over n squared this should equal some cd which will be expressed as a similar uh, infinite product. Um, uh, and the theorem of myself and Mark this conjecture is true. for Q greater than almost like 700,000 P squared. So the, the quality of the constant uh, in, um, has degraded somewhat from, from, from the Chawla bound, uh, but other than the constant, it's still a, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, it still holds for all but finitely many finite fields except for the prime fields and the quadratic extensions of prime fields. Um, and, um, So this is a linear statement. Um, and just like for Chawla, there is a kind of nonlinear analog for, um, for polynomials. Uh, so the conjecture statement horn uh, is if we let G and Z of X be an irreducible polynomial. Gopher is not here. I should probably say that isn't this conjecture false when Q equals two and D equals one? Uh, 
oh, CD will just be zero in that case. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so, right, so here also, I mean, if D is odd, then it's CD is... Don't even need to, you don't need to say D even, yeah. Yeah, um, it's, it's a product of lo lo local factors. Um, and then, yeah, so, so one wants, right, so one, one should put a statement giving a criterion for the conjecture to be, um, to, for CD to be non-zero, because it's kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah, but it, the, the, the conjecture, you know, is, is that it's, or sorry, the statement is it's non-zero if there's no local obstruction, because CD is encapsulating local obstructions to, um, to irreducibility. Um, so if you take the limit of x plus infinity, the size of the set of natural numbers n, n less than x, where g of n is prime, divided by x over log x should be, again, some constant, depending on g. Yeah. So here, did you prove uh, just that uh, the CD, or did you prove the value of the CD to be? Uh, yes. The, the value of the CD is what you expect. And it, 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 it's a very precise statement. So the value of CD is what you expect. Um, and it's with some explicit error term. Also, are reasonably for the error term of, 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 of power savings type. Um, um, yeah. And um, I. Okay, great question. So, so, um, you, you, which conjecture do you think of? Like, Bayman Horn. So, it's pretty simple. It is unknown for every single polynomial except for the linear polynomial. So, um, the, the only thing we can do is if you have a multivariate polynomial, then you can sometimes count prime factors. Uh, in particular, the polynomial n squared plus m, sorry, prime values, n squared plus m to the 4 is uh, known by Duke Freelander and Vonich to have infinitely many prime values, but there's no, there's not a single one variable polynomial that's not linear that's known to take infinitely many prime values. <laughs> um, so for so here CG is not zero if uh, the leading coefficient of G is positive. And no prime P divides G of N for all N and Z. Um, so unless there's some kind of obstruction to getting infinitely many primes, I mean, assuming you, the first one is only being obstruction if you, if you don't count negative numbers as primes, um, then uh, you should get infinitely many primes under this conjecture. Um, and I, I, can, I, I can explain the formulas for any of these concepts if anybody want, want, wants to know how you write it down. They're all based on kind of the same principle. So what's the FQ joint T conjecture? We want to take G in FQ of T comma X irreducible, uh, not in FQ of T comma X to the P for the, for the same reason. Um, the limit as N goes to infinity number of f in fqt plus degree f is m g of f irreducible 
divided by q to the n over n uh, should be some constant depending on g. Um, and the theorem here, uh, so for p odd, okay, this one, okay, this one should also have p odd. For p odd, q greater than 2 to the 10 times 3 squared times e squared times p to the 4. Um, Uh, uh, then this conjecture holds uh, for monic polynomials of degree two. I again mean Euler's number, yes. That's a great question. So the Euler's number actually comes out of, not out of the cohomology vanishing step here, but out of the Betty number bounds. Uh, if you estimate um, the, the Betty number bounds we get, uh, which in the simplest cases we know are actually sharp, these Betty number bounds are expressed using binomial coefficients. And if you estimate binomial coefficients using Sterling's formula and try to see when they beat an exponential, then Euler's number pops up. Um, so the, yeah, if you, if you really optimize everything, the formula would be slightly different uh, but it's a very small savings and for, for, for a great increase uh, in, the, in the complexity of the formula. Um, so like we can think of this as including like the analog of things like the, the conjecture there's infinitely many prime primes of the form n squared plus 1, for example, because that's a monic polynomial of degree 2 um, in n. Uh, and the method here should work for non-monic f of degree 2. Uh, we just didn't, um, uh, it would have been a little more complex to prove. We didn't feel like proving it. The paper was kind of already long enough. So. Both of these results are proven using our work on the Mobius function as a key ingredient. And um, so, so, so the, to, to explain them, I need to explain the relationship between primes and the Mobius function. Um, and so the, the, the relation uh, becomes a, a bit nicer to express in terms of the von Eigel function. Um, so let me write this just in, in, in terms of polynomials, although the, the same thing was defined much earlier for numbers. This is a function which takes non-zero values on primes uh, and also on prime powers. So it is equal to degree pi if f is equal to pi to the r for pi prime, r greater than 0, and 0 otherwise. Um, 
And over the, the natural numbers, it would have the same definition with a log instead of a degree. Um, and then the, so the counting primes of a given form, for example, prime values of g of f, is almost exactly the same thing as summing the von Mangold function over g of f because the prime power contributions are very easy to rule out. It's very easy to bound how many prime powers are appearing and throw those away. And once you remove the prime power, you only have to divide by the degree to get back the prime counting function. So almost any time in analytic number theory, problems about the von Mangold function are equivalent to problems about counting primes, but the von Mangold function is a little bit um, analytically nicer because, for example, if I have a monic polynomial f, I can write lambda f as the sum over monic polynomials g, g dividing f of the Mobius function of g times the degree of f over g. Um, so uh, um, this is kind of inclusion, exclusion uh, in terms of the different, the different prime factors of, uh, of f. And y y y y you can check um, that this is non-vanishing exactly for, uh, for, for, for prime powers. Um, and another interpretation is identity is the von Mangold function is the coefficient of the logarithmic derivative of a zeta function. Mobius is the coefficient of the inverse of the zeta function. And this degree is the coefficient of the derivative. Uh, and so this is an expression of the idea that the logarithmic derivative is equal to the derivative divided by the original function. And the, the exact analogous thing is, is, is true more classically for natural numbers. So any time I have a counting fu problem about the primes, I can reduce it to a von Mangold fu function. And then using this identity, von Mangold sum reduces it to a more complicated sum with Mobius. Um, so it's, 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 it's simpler to do the reduction in the, uh, the Bateman-Horn case, even, even though that case is, 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 is more difficult overall. So this, uh, this count of primes degree f as n, g of f prime uh, is roughly the sum over f monic degree n von Mangold function of g of f times 1 over roughly 2n, or 2n for in the monic case, uh, because each, each prime will contribute to 2n here. Uh, and that is equal to the sum over f and fqt plus degree f is equal to n. Now we'll sum over g in fqt plus, g dividing f, sorry, g dividing g of f, okay, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll make that an h, h dividing g of f, vom, uh, Mobius function of h, uh, and then 2n minus degree of h. Um, and so the strategy uh, is to break the sum up 
depending on the degree of age. So for terms where the degree of h is less than or equal, let's say, yeah, less than or equal to n, um, it makes sense to fix h and sum over f. So we're summing over f where g of f is a multiple of h. Uh, we fix h sum over f with h dividing g of f, which is basically a congruence condition on f, which is a congruence condition on f mod h. Um, and so we're, we're counting solutions to a congruence and because the degree of h is less than the degree of f, the number of solutions is proportional to the number of residue classes that solve it. Uh, and this is something that's multiplicative in h. We can use the Chinese remainder theorem to split it up as a product over primes dividing h. Um, and then the Mobius function is also multiplicative. So we end up with a multiplicative function and um, it, 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 matches, it matches our predicted constant CG. So these terms give CG. Give CG. Um, so if you think about, it, like in particular, just the case where H is 1, mu of H is 1, every F satisfy this. So this will give the main term of size Q to the N. The terms where h is kind of a small degree are giving adjustments to the main term, but they're all relatively easy to calculate. Uh, there is there is no more. Well, sort of. There, there'll be a little bit more. There'll be so yeah. There'll be a little bit more. It's 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 yes. Uh, uh, if degree of h is larger than n, up at least maybe larger than like a, one plus delta times n for n small, then uh, what we we want to do the opposite thing. We want to fix g of f over h. So make a new variable to be g of f over h, um, and then sum over f, where g of f is a multiple of the new variable. So I'll call it, I don't know, I'll call it w. Um, and then we want to sum over f, where w divides g of f. And we get a Mobius function now of g of f over w. Um, and so W dividing G of F is a congruence condition on F modulo W. The solution is an arithmetic regression. So we can re-parameterize the solution in terms of like a new variable, F is equal to like W F star plus B. And if we plug in W F star plus B in here, we get a polynomial in F star. So we end up with Mobius of a polynomial in F star. And then we apply Chawa. Um, and what's missing is some, some tiny range in the middle where the degree h is approximately equal to n. And here we have to do something different. Um, and uh, the, the trick we do involves the classic number theory of, of quadratic forms. Uh, so the, um, what you can show is there exists f where 
H divides G of F if and only if H is represented uh, by certain quadratic forms. Um, so the first case of this is, is a, a, a natural number is going to divide n squared plus 1 for some n, if and only if that natural number can be written as a sum of two squares, or more precisely a sum of two relatively prime squares. Uh, and you can, exp you can approximate n, like the number, the number you're squaring, in terms of, well, you can, you can approximate the, the or you can approximate f in terms of the, 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 the vector you plug into this quadratic form to represent your number. Um, so we had to kind of redo in the setting of polynomials over finite fields a bunch of the kind of classical theory of quadratic forms. Um, and what you end up with is you end up with some of Mobius evaluated at some kind of quadratic form, uh, but then you end up with some weird extra terms. You end up with like additive characters applied to like the ratio of like x and y, um, uh, which comes from basically. If you want to know if h divides g of f for some f in terms of quadratic forms, that's more simple. But if you want to know h divides g of f for f of a particular degree in terms of quadratic forms, it gets a little bit more complicated. And so what you have to do is you express this in terms of this, this sum looks similar to our Chawla type sums, except there exists this additive character in here. Um, and so we have to run the argument proving Chawla's conjecture in a greater level of generality where you allow certain uh, twists. Um, in, in this case, a, a twist by an additive character at like some kind of residue at infinity of a ratio of two polynomials. Um, and so in the geometric setting that turns out to be studying the same cohomology groups but for a somewhat more complicated sheaf. We're, we're, we're twisting with a sheaf that may be wildly ramified because every time there's an additive character here we get a sheaf with monodromy of order p and that gives wild ramification. Um, but if we're summing, I guess if we're summing in the, in the y variable, or, yeah, sorry, it's x inverse mod y. x inverse mod y. Because it's x inverse mod y, the, um, there's no ramification, there's no wild ramification at infinity. There's only wild ramification at some of these hyperplanes. So, th so, so we're in a more general situation, but the geometry is, is pretty similar. We still have the same set of hyperplanes and the same transversality, and we can run uh, the, same, the same kind of argument. Um, and for, for the twin primes conjecture, the argument is simpler, except we have two primes now, so you need to apply this identity twice and you have two different divisors whose degrees vary. So you have to split up into more different cases. Uh, and again, there's a middle case. And in that case, to deal with the middle case, um, we used a, uh, a, a purely number theoretic argument, uh, going back to something done by Fouvry. Uh, And um, 
maybe in the last few minutes I'll say uh, what is um, what is the way to think about the von Mangel function and this identity um, geometrically. Uh, because and that that we, we didn't use that geometric perspective of von, von Mangel for this problem, we just reduced to Mobius, but the, the geometric perspective of von Mangel is helpful for other problems. So if you look at the space affine space an parameterizes monic polynomials of degree n. degree n. And inside it, we have the space uh, parameterizing square-free polynomials, or conf which is the same thing as configurations of n unordered points in, in A1. Parameterizes square-free polynomials. Um, and so the roots uh, define an n to one cover of confen, uh, and thus a homomorphism, a map from pi one of confen to SM. And so representations of Sn give locally constant sheaves. Sheaves on confidence. Um, and these sheaves extend naturally to a n. Um, they extend to a n. And there's two different ways you could try to extend a sheaf. You could try one very uh, naive way. You can say, you know, I just learned a sheaf theory. I just learned about push forwards. Let's just push forward my sheaf from confident to a n. Or you could try to be very sophisticated and be like, I learned about derived categories, and then I learned about perverse sheaves, and I learned that the best way to extend a perverse sheave is by taking the intermediate extension of perverse sheaves. Uh, but these two get you the same answer in, in this case. So, um, uh, and, and, and interestingly, either one gives you the same extension when you extend in that way, you get functions which are also nice uh, from a number theory perspective. Um, uh, and so the trace functions, they are trace functions, uh, give arithmetic functions. Um, so the, the Mobius function corresponds to, well, minus 1 to the n times uh, the function, the trace of Frobenius on the sine representation for, or, or the sheaf corresponding to the sine representation for exactly the reason that we just said. So the, the trace of Frobenius on the sheaf corresponding to the sine representation is nothing but the sine of Frobenius. Um, which, which, which counts the parity of, of the number of orbits of Frobenius. And if you extend the sheaf corresponding to the sign representation to the complement of, to, to an, it'll vanish everywhere on the complement of conf n, matching how the Mobius function vanishes. Um, and the von Mangelt function 
is the sum from d equals 0 to m minus 1 minus 1 to the d, the trace of Frobenius on wedge d of the standard representation. Um, so this is the n minus 1 dimensional standard representation of, of n. Um, so why does this work? What are we doing? We're evaluating the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius at 1 when we're taking. This is the dth coefficient of the characteristic polynomial, and we're summing it. We end up with the evaluation of the characteristic polynomial at 1. So this vanishes. So this is 0 if and only if Frobenius has 1 as an eigenvalue on standard. This n minus 1 dimensional standard representation, which happens if and only if Frobenius has 1 as an eigenvalue twice. On the kind of the n dimensional, on the permutation representation. On the permutation representation, which happens if and only if it has two orbits, because you get a one, one, one eigenspace for each orbit. Uh, and so this, this will vanish unless you have one orbit. If you have one orbit, the characteristic polynomial is t to the n minus 1 on the standard representation. So it's t to the n minus 1 over t minus 1, or on the permutation representation, t to the n minus 1 over t minus 1 on the standard. And so you get n. Um, and then perhaps miraculously, extending this sheaf in the natural way from square free polynomials to all polynomials gives the kind of extension of the prime counting function that number theorists have found most convenient to work with. Um, and so uh, this identity from the representation theoretic perspective comes from a rep relationship between these wedge power representations and the sign representations that if you induce from a product of smaller symmetric groups the sign representations you get a wedge power of two copies of the you get a wedge power of the permutation representation which you can split as two wedge powers of the standard representation and by taking a suitable linear combination of those, you can find a single wedge power of the standard representation. Um, and uh, for some arithmetic problems, in particular the problem of summing these functions in arithmetic regressions to square free modulus, you can kind of work conveniently in this level of generality of an arbitrary representation of Sn. You can calculate the cohomology twisted by an arbitrary representation of Sn, and so you can, you can obtain uh, results for, for quite general um, arithmetic functions in, in this way. OK, thank you for inviting me to speak here. So you've talked a lot about problems which you kind of like, you just kind of take them from like the rational numbers yeah. to kind of the finite field setting. Are there like problems which um, like which are new in the finite field setting or are there like problems which don't carry over? Like um, is there like, is, is there actually like a difference between, <coughs> like is there sometimes a difference between the two somehow? There are, there are differences, certainly. So I mean for example, this phenomenon we saw that the Mobius function for certain polynomials becomes periodic is not something that we believe happens over the integers, even though it was, so there's, there are, and then it's very, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's also easy to make differences if you don't like properly account for things like the fact that the place at infinity is non-Archimedean in the function real case instead of Archimedean. Um, Uh, so th there, there are. Um, so, yeah. So, in, so in talking about 
questions with an origin in the, the function field setting that don't come from classical number theory, I think it's somewhat subtle because if you had an origin that was completely unrelated to classical number theory, it's not clear that would be a number theoretic question. You could say it's just a general kind of question about the algebra of finite fields or the geometry of curves over finite fields, maybe. Um, but one example I can think of is there's questions where you consider, you take a number theoretic question and you tra transfer it into the functional context and then you modify it in a way that makes sense in the functional context but doesn't make sense over um, number fields. And so an example of this is any of these kinds of statistics questions where I asked about the statistics of number fields. In function fields, those correspond to statistics of curves that are covers of a fixed curve, like, like degree D covers of P1 or something like that. But when you're considering curves, it's not so natural to look at degree D covers of P1. It seems more natural to just look at all curves of a given genus. So any kind of statistical question you can ask for number fields, you can ask an analogous statistical question in function fields on average over all curves of a given genus, which unfortunately will probably be really hard because we do not have any idea how many curves of a given genus there are over FQ. We have no idea what the growth rate of the number of smooth curves of genus G is over FQ as G goes to infinity with fixed Q. Well, we have, some upper, we have some upper bounds, but other than that, we don't really know. Like, okay, we have upper bounds and lower bounds, but there's a pretty big gap between them. Um, uh, so th this is the kind of question. And then like, some things that are easier, like there are some problems where you, number theorists would study them over a given number field, but you would never think to ask for uniformity as you vary the number field. But in the function field context, it is kind of natural to look for uniformity as you vary the field. And, and those can potentially be uh, more tractable. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think that's, that's something that, ma that, that makes the most sense as a kind of question, which doesn't, you can't carry it back to the functional context because you know it doesn't sorry number fields because in number fields you, you can't just take an arbitrary number field of a given genus that doesn't really make sense.